It's been a few years now, but in the past I have served as a substitute teacher at Cassville High School. Good times were had by all. Um, I don't know if you know the process of how that all works out, but if a teacher knows that they're going to be gone, the teacher will often leave the substitute with a list of what each class is to do. And so as the substitute, you may have a, a piece of paper there in front of you, and it may say like, first hour, these kids need to read this book, or they need to complete this task, or log on to this website, or there, there might be something. But there's a list of things that, I, that the substitute is supposed to accomplish. We, you've probably done this before, maybe not as a teacher to a substitute, but maybe you've done this if you've ever had children and you're leaving for the weekend or you're going to be gone for the evening. Maybe you left your, your kids a list of things that they, they have to do. I can remember whenever we would leave Alex at home during the summers, Janelle would create a list for him of, of things that he had to accomplish. And inevitably, we'd get back and he hadn't even read the list. Didn't even know the list existed. Well, we are looking at these last eyewitness accounts of the risen Jesus. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 1. This is the final appearance that we'll talk about post-resurrection. This is the point where Jesus departs this world and He returns to heaven. And when they call it the ascension, and the ascension holds great significance for us today. Uh, there are plenty of instructions that as He departs, He leaves behind. Look at Acts chapter 1, starting with verse 6. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking Him, Lord, has the time come for You to free Israel and restore our kingdom? And He replied, The Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they're not for You to know. But You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon You, and You will be My witnesses telling people about Me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After saying this, he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. As they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. I like this particular story. It has major implications for how we are to live today as Christians who are left behind in this world. Several years ago, we looked at a whole sermon series on the kingdom of God. We began to compare and contrast the kingdom of heaven with the kingdom of this world. In this particular passage, Jesus leaves this kingdom for His kingdom, and we're left behind. And He gives those last few instructions to the disciples before He ascends to heaven. This is Luke's account of the last eyewitness account of Jesus. And Jesus at this particular point, He has, from the time that He was resurrected until this point where He ascends to heaven, He has done a lot of discussion with those disciples concerning the kingdom of God. In, in fact, if you want to look up at verse 3 in, verse, in chapter 1, it says, During the 40 days after His crucifixion, He appeared to the apostles from time to time, and He proved to them in many ways that He was actually alive. Last, verse, last sentence, and He talked to them about the kingdom of God. So He's been talking to them about the kingdom of God, and as He gets ready to ascend, this major topic of conversation, that's what their question is about. So, over the last 40 days, he's been talking and talking and talking about the kingdom of God. He's ready to ascend, and their last question is concerning the kingdom of God. Verse 6, they say, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? Their, their question is actually something that we've, we're starting to deal with at length on Wednesday nights in our adult Bible study. They're asking a question about the end times. Lord, is the end times coming now? Is, is, are, you, are you going to set up your kingdom? So they, I mean, the disciples, they really, they've understood Jesus' teaching so far. They know that He has told them, I'll come back. I'm going to go to my Father's home, but I'll come back. 
And they know that when He returns, He's going to establish His kingdom on earth and He will rule and reign. And that's why they're asking this question, is the end near? Are, are, you, are you going to be gone for another 40 days and then come back? How's this going to play out? And His response, His response is the Father alone knows the plan and the timing. So, number one in what we want to learn from this is that we have to learn as believers who are still on this planet that we have to trust God's plan and His timing. That's what Jesus is saying here. He's saying don't get caught up in all of the useless predictions and debates concerning the end times you worry about right now. You take care of business. None of those plans about the end times are your concern. You know, I, I myself, I pay attention to these things. I've noticed an uptick in the amount of interest that revolves around end times. The, the, I mean, those events of the, the last days of this planet, the, everything that surrounds that, there's been more interest in that now than ever before in the history of this world. The, the number of books and movies and magazines and TV shows, documentaries, discussions. I mean, it seems like every month some pastor has got a new book out predicting when the end times are going to come and what it's all going to look like and, and trying to interpret all of the symbols found in the book of Revelations. Uh, a whole industry has developed around the prediction of the end times. In fact, the number one TV show over the last decade... The Walking Dead. It's a TV show about the apocalypse. About, I mean, it's a different take on the apocalypse, of course, which I don't necessarily condone, but it is a pretty good show. But that, I mean, that, that's a big deal now. Everybody's paying a lot of attention to that. Everybody's got their ears perked up. And so Jesus is actually rebuking them here, and He's saying, don't get caught up. Don't be so concerned with my return be concerned with my work. Don't worry about all of the, the predictions and when's this going to happen and how's this going to play out. Be concerned about my work. And we'll talk more about that work in just a second. So that's number one. Trust God in all of this. Trust His plan. Trust His timing. Not only for end times. Not only for biblical things and biblical teachings. But trust His plan and timing in your own life. And you begin to consider, when should I do this, Lord? When should I get married? When should I move away? Should I take this job? Should this happen? Trust God's plan and trust His timing. Don't get ahead of Him. Don't try to interpret all of the things that are going along. Just sit back, relax. Trust the Lord to work them out. Number two, the, the second thing that happens here that within the whole context of the ascension that's important for you and I is one of the things that the disciples are really struggling with here. He's removing His physical presence and so His physical presence may have left this earth but He has left us with His spiritual presence. Of course, I'm referring to the Holy Spirit. So after He has rebuked them for their unnecessary concern over end times, He follows that rebuke. Look at verse 6 or verse 8. He says, you know, at the end of 7, he says, they're not for you to know, and then the clause that follows that, but you. Don't be con so concerned about future events. Worry about the now, because you're going to receive my presence, the Holy Spirit. Jesus is physically departing this world. He's going to return to his Father and his home but the Scriptures say, and we'll look at it in just a second back in John, the Scriptures and Jesus' idea here is that when He leaves, we actually benefit. I don't think the disciples would have agreed with that. They actually probably see Jesus' departure as a negative. This is a bad deal. How are we going to operate? Who's going to lead us? But Jesus said that it is to your benefit that I leave. He addressed this. It's in John 16:7. If you don't have a Bible, you, I've got it up on the screen. Here's what it says. John 16, 7. These are Jesus' words. But in fact, it is best for you that I go away. 
Because if I don't, the advocate won't come. The advocate being the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, we will be better off when He ascends to heaven. All, so, this, this whole idea, and they're freaking out. But Jesus knows, if I don't return to the Father, the Holy Spirit won't come and live inside us. And He really believes it's a far better deal for you and I. His, when He's here. I heard a pastor ask this question one time. What would you rather have? Would you rather have Jesus in the flesh and blood on this planet or would you rather have the Holy Spirit? I think the answer is a no-brainer. See, the Holy Spirit is available to all believers. It resides within us. Jesus is limited because of His physical form. And so when He leaves, His presence to all believers is no longer limited. It's no longer limited to a few select people. His presence can now dwell in every single one of us. And when He dwells within every single one of us, that Holy Spirit, His presence, that spiritual presence, provides us with a power that we've never known before. The Holy Spirit will fill us with that same power that resurrected Jesus from the dead. What an incredible power. Paul said this as much. It's in Romans chapter 8, verse 11. Paul says, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, He will also give life to your mortal bodies by this same Spirit living within you. So, that presence of the Spirit is going to be absolutely essential. That power that raised Christ from the dead, that now lives and dwells in each and every single one of us as believers, Absolutely essential. And why is it essential? Because He has left us a job to do. He has given us a new task. That task is right there in the first, first book, or first chapter of Acts. The task, He says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And here's the task. And you will be My witnesses telling people about Me everywhere. You see, He has given us the task of spreading the good news. He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. So this power is going to enable us to spread this good news. And that good news changes people's lives. That good news is, is something that everybody needs to hear. And they, the Scriptures are clear. They can't believe the good news unless somebody tells them. Look at this verse out of Romans chapter 10. How can they believe in Him unless someone tells them? We are the conduit, we are the vehicle by which the good news is spread throughout this planet. So, when you talk about this new task that we've been given, there is a particular person whenever there's a task given, there's someone that's responsible for that task in this particular case. Those that are responsible for the task? You and I. Us. Believers. Those who would call Christ Lord. He says, but you. Verse 8, but you. He's talking to the church. He's talking to all believers for all time. Anyone who claims Christ, we are the vehicle by which God is going to redeem this broken world. We are the mouthpieces, we are the representatives, we are the ambassadors of this new kingdom. And if we remain silent, no one comes to faith. What an incredible burden that we have. I want to ask a question, just for you to contemplate. When is the last time that you ever shared the plan of salvation with another human being? When is the last time that you sat and had a conversation where you talked about sin and you talked about Christ's sacrifice and you talked about how that sacrifice paid for our sins? When is the last time that you shared what you believe with another human being? My guess, and I'm not, I'm not trying to beat nobody up, not trying to step on no toes, not trying to be ugly. All right, y'all, hear me. My guess would be, not very many people in this room have done that. Not only recently, ever. Do you not know how? 
Are you scared? Are you intimidated? A lot of people say, well, I, I just don't know what to say. Or what if they ask me a hard question? Share your experience. Nobody can argue with what God has done in your life. I want, to just, I want to just encourage you. This task has been given to us. All of us that are in here, if you, if you have ever accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, and you're in here this morning, and you're sitting here with the confidence that I'm going to heaven, you have an incredible responsibility to share that with someone else. Are you so cold-hearted that you would sit back and just say, I'm cool with you going to hell. I don't need to share with you. I don't need to tell you. I, I, I don't want to embarrass myself. What if they ask a hard question? I, maybe I couldn't answer it. We are who is responsible for this task. Be about this task, y'all. Be about this task. I know that you know people that do not have a personal relationship with Christ. I know that you go to school with people who don't know Jesus. I know that you live next door to people that don't know Jesus. I know that you work with people that don't know Jesus. What is the barrier? What's preventing you from opening your mouth? What is keeping you silent? Another thing that we see about this whole new task is that He's actually given us the power to accomplish this task. That power that is given, the thing that we should tap into in order to accomplish the task is the power of the Holy Spirit. He gave us the Holy Spirit for a reason. The Holy Spirit was given to us so that we could accomplish this task. Accomplish the task of telling other people. He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And that Holy Spirit, that power is the same power that raised Christ from the dead. And it will help us to accomplish the task. You're not expected to accomplish this task on your own strength, on your own wisdom, on your own verbal communication skills. That's not what you should rely on to share your faith. What you should rely on is the power of the Spirit living within you. You see, the Holy Spirit, the, the, the whole idea of us sharing the gospel, talking to uh, someone else about our faith, the whole idea behind that, God knew, I don't want you to accomplish this in your own strength. I'm going to give you everything you need to accomplish it. And it's all going to be wrapped up in the presence of the Holy Spirit. I think that's, that's so important because... The Holy Spirit is going to give you the words to say. The Holy Spirit is going to intercede for you while you're sharing your faith. The Holy Spirit's going to inform you how to answer questions and how to approach people. The Holy Spirit is going to grant you a confidence and it's going to grant you a... In your mind, you're going to have some sort of authority that I can be talking about this and you're going to be filled with courage and boldness and, and it's going to provide you with insight and ability but why do we just shut it off by not even opening our mouths? We're not tapping into it. It's like, you know, I'm, I'm really in the market for one of those uh, battery-powered saws, like a, like a chainsaw. I'm not man enough to have a gas-powered one, okay? So I, I want one of those battery powered You charge it up, you know, or maybe it has the rechargeable battery that you put in and out. Man, I, you know how freakishly detailed I am about everything. I have been researching these things for weeks. And I want one really bad. I haven't told my wife. This is the first she's hearing about it, okay? Forgive me, honey. But I really want one of those battery-powered chainsaws because I've got some sticks I want to cut. Right? I want to feel real manly. But you know what? That thing would be absolutely worthless if I don't charge the battery and put the battery in. If I just, if I just pick that saw up and never use the power source... It's not even going to turn on. I'm not going to cut no sticks. I'm not going to trim no trees. Don't even try it. And another thing. Maybe you're some, one of those people that you've tried sharing your faith before and you failed miserably. And you walked away and kind of going, wow, what? I, I was just talking about this and then this happened and and you feel like a failure, you feel miserable, you feel 
insignificant. Maybe, maybe in some level you think, I've done more harm than I've done good. If, if you're one of those that has attempted the task and failed and gave up, I would, I would ask you to go back and revisit that one more time. Were you ac- trying to accomplish that task with your own wisdom, with your own insight? Or were you using the power of the Holy Spirit? And the second thing is, you need to understand this. Failure doesn't mean that you're a failure. It takes someone eight interactions with the gospel before they come to faith. Maybe you're number one, number two, number three. Maybe you're moving them down the line. Maybe you're pushing them forward. Maybe, maybe you've helped the cause a little bit. Maybe you've provided a little bit more insight. You know, people, whenever they come to faith, if they've had somebody sharing with them Jesus time and time again, maybe this is second or third time in a month that somebody's mentioned the name Jesus. Maybe there's something to this. See, God will be the, be the, the motivator. He'll be the one that will, will call that person to faith. Your responsibility is just open your mouth. Don't be afraid. You see, our responsibility in the whole thing, He says you will receive power comes when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will, here's what we're supposed to do, our responsibility, be my witnesses. That means that we are simply to share what we've, what we've experienced, what we've seen, what we know. Share how you've learned. Share how you've changed. Nobody can argue with with a changed life. Talk to them about what you were like before and what you're like now. You see, our responsibility is just to share the story of Jesus and what He's done. That's all we're to do. Just share. The responsibility for someone coming to faith is not on your shoulders. That's God's responsibility. Your responsibility is open your mouth and be a witness. And so the last thing I want you to see in this is that the the plan for the task, how we're to go about the task, how this strategy looks like is start where you're at. He says, you'll be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem. That's where they were at. So in our context, start in Purdy. Start where you live, start in your neighborhood, start, start in your classroom, start in your work area. I mean, this is really easy. This is, this is, this is no-brainer stuff. Just start right where you are. You don't, a lot of people think that going and sharing my faith, I'm going to have to get a passport, I'm going to have to get all these stinking shots, I'm going to have to learn a new language. No, 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 no. Start where you're at. Tell somebody that lives next door. Just find people within your sphere of influence and share the story of Jesus right there. And then begin to move out. When you've, when you've been responsible and you've taken care of this, you'll be given more responsibility. And your sphere of influence will increase. Along the way, I promise you, I promise you, along the way, you're going to fail miserably. You're going to experience failure. You're going to experience persecution. People are going to make fun of you for what you believe and what you say. You're going to experience rejection where somebody will hear you out and then say, I don't believe none of that. But so did Jesus. (laughs) Even the guy that the story is about was rejected. The divine, perfect Son of God was rejected. You can't bat a thousand. It's an impossibility. Jesus experienced rejection. As His followers, we can expect to experience rejection as well. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you how to uh, avoid being rejected. Keep your mouth shut. That's the only way that you can bat a thousand. Actually, you're batting zero. So you're kind of like Matt Carpenter. Uh, I'll get I'll get in trouble for that one later. Anyway, I want to just wrap this up by uh, uh, mentioning something to you. You're probably not even aware of this. I, I 
I guess this week is uh, Teacher Appreciation Week. Is that right? Is that what you told me, Shirley? And then, so like earlier, it was like Administrative Assistant Week. Uh, so I don't know where all these calendars are coming from, but there is a Christian calendar, and, and I don't really pay a lot of attention to the Christian calendar outside of like Christmas and Easter. But if you look at the Christmas calendar, May 15th this year is the traditional Feast of the Ascension. You ever heard of that? The Feast of the Ascension? It, it, it's, it marks 40 days after the resurrection. So in our Easter, then you count 39 days, and you come up to May 15th. Protestants, we really, we really don't celebrate this day, but there's a lot of Roman Catholics and Anglicans and some Methodists that, that celebrate the Feast of the Ascension. And you know, in not necessarily in Western culture, but in the Eastern culture, they often celebrate and observe some of these holy days. They commemorate them by uh, performing works of art, if you will. I, I mean, they may put on a, they, they may write a new musical piece, or they might sculpt a, a, a statue, or they may paint a, an oil painting. I come across this, this is one of the oldest oil paintings in, in Christendom. And this is from the 6th century, so that'd be 500 to 599 A.D. And, and the name of this is the Rabula Gospel. Um, and so this is actually found in a monastery over in Mesopotamia at that time. And it's in a book, one of the oldest manuscripts, Christian manuscripts that we have, but it's a painting that would come between John and Acts, found in the book. And if I don't know if you can really tell it, but see how the disciples are looking towards heaven? When, when you begin to look at all of the paintings that have been created to commemorate the Feast of the Assumption over the years, those paintings all basically have one thing in common. Jesus in the air and the disciples looking up at Him. In the passage that we read, the Scriptures say that as the disciples were looking up, that two men in white robes appeared to them, and so they're, they're an angel of some form, and their message to the disciples that are sitting there gawking, the message that those two men in the white robes have is, stop looking around and get back to work. And I think that same message is a message we need to hear this morning. Let's just stop looking around and waiting for somebody else to do something or looking for a particular sign and let's be about His work. We've been given a task to do while the Master's away. The teacher's left and they've left a list. And to be honest, I don't think we've checked very many things off of it. We need to stop feeling sorry for ourselves on what's going on in this world today. And stop looking around and saying, oh, there's a sign of the end times or Jesus is surely going to come back now. Look at what they've done in Israel. We, we need to get back to doing what we've been told to do. We need to get back to, to doing the work of the Gospel. We need to go and share the Gospel. I mean, it's not going to be comfortable. It's not going to be glamorous. It's not going to be convenient. But it is your responsibility. And so we should get ready for His return, not by standing and looking for all of the signs and trying to interpret what's going on in the day. We need to prepare for His return by working hard to spread the good news. We need to, we need to respond by building churches that, within churches of people that love one another for the benefit of the community and the glorification of the name of Christ. Let's get off our hands and start doing something. Share what you believe with someone. You may be moving them down the road. Or you may find it an opportunity to rejoice in sharing somebody Christ and them coming to faith. Let's pray.
Lord, I, um, I apologize for my apathy. Lord, I apologize for the times that I haven't, I haven't focused on being about Your work. Father, I've been more about me than about You. And Lord, I know that You have blessed us in this place for a particular time and a particular purpose. Lord, and I pray for all of us that are in this room, all of us that, that claim the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that we would begin to plug into that power source and allow the Holy Spirit to be our mouthpiece. To give us the words to say and the, the timing when to say it and the person who to say it to. Father, I know that You have given us this task. And I feel an awesome responsibility for this place. Lord, and I know that You could take Your hand off of us in the blink of an eye because we have not been about Your business. And that's not some place I want to be. So Lord, I pray that You would empower us, that You would fill us with courage. Lord, that You bring people along our path where we, where we feel comfortable and and Lord, that we will feel that opportunity to begin to share the plan of salvation. That's what you've left us to do. You've given us everything that we need for that task. And so Lord, I just pray that we would be about your business. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Would you stand to your feet? Ben's going to lead us in one last verse. If there's anything that you'd like to speak about, I'll be down front here. Maybe you want to join the church. Maybe you need to be baptized. Maybe... Maybe you just need, you have something going on in your life and you need prayer about. You can come right down. I'll be willing to talk to you. No problem. You can always also call me here at the office. You can send me an email, homing pigeon, write me a letter, whatever. Um, but we want to walk with you through the stages of life. And so I want you just to begin to think about all that Christ has done for you over this next verse. Reflect on that. Would you please? If you're interested in end times, if you want to know more about what the book of Revelation says, we just began a study on Wednesday nights in, in the fireplace room, and we're looking at a very slow pace because I don't understand all of it either. We're going to be looking at end times and trying to interpret some of those things. I mean, it's not a big focus where we're going to take our eyes off what we're supposed to do, but I think that it's, it's good. There's lots of questions that always surround that. So anyway, that's all I have. Thanks for joining us this morning. You're dismissed. Have a great week.